Hallelujah. Y'all doing okay this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we're going to be reading out of the book of Hosea a little bit. I didn't really uh, title my message this morning. I think that if I was going to title it, what the thought that came to my mind, it probably would have been kind of like shopping. <clears throat> that shocking title would have been a backsliding heifer. <laughs> so why don't we just type it in there real quick? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Let's read Hosea chapter 4. Verse 16, and then we're going to read Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Hosea 4, 16, the Lord speaks through the prophet Hosea, and he says, For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. And then Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord. For he has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. You know, well, first let me just pray. Father, in the name of yes, Jesus, I just Lord. pray again and pray, Lord God, that you would speak, Lord God, the word that I believe that you put on my heart, Lord. It's so much more palatable when you speak it, Lord God, rather than the words of a man. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would allow the truth of your word that was written so many years ago to be alive this morning, Lord God, and that it would be receptive to the heart, Lord God, and that we'd be able to see, Lord God, what it is you desire to say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, the story of Hosea is one of those classic examples of how I try to talk to you a lot about in the Old Testament or really throughout the scriptures about a type of Israel as compared to Christian. You know how I talk about that all the time. Israel like the older brother and Christian as the younger brother and how Israel as a collective whole, as the people of God on a journey upon the earth. And we can see their lives and their journey and their wanderings and we can see their failures and, and we can see that even whenever they fail, they come to the Lord and they ask for forgiveness and, and God is God moves upon the, those, those desires of their heart and he responds to them and he gives promises throughout the Old Testament even whenever his people find themselves out of the way he, re he relentlessly gives promises that there's gonna there's a better day coming amen there's a day of hope there's a day of restoration and just as Israel is the people of God Christian also and I, I that's how I just have seen it that's how God put it in my heart that Israel is the older brother I think I used to know two brothers one of his older brother was Israel and the younger brother was named Christian and I guess that's just how I see them you know the family of God like God's written the story twice and he read it wrote it and it's the same story it's a it's a message of unity but he wrote it twice and and so that we could be able to see it so we'd get a revelation of it so that we wouldn't miss it that's because, right. you know, sometimes in our own hearts and in our own minds, we're kind of hard headed. I don't know if you've ever been that way, but Lord knows that I've been a very stubborn person. And, and yet at the same time, God is merciful and he's gracious and he'll write the same story time and again, even in the lives of characters and, and even so oftentimes in little areas that you can't even see unless you dig really deep. You know, the Apostle Paul, this is one of the things that kind of gave me a revelation of this. He said it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church of Corinth, and he said, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted. When he says them, he's using that plural pronoun to collectively speak of Israel of old. He says, And were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, King James, for as examples to set the standard to show us what happens to God's people whenever they don't follow his course, when they don't follow his way. And they are written for our admonition, the word admonition there being a word for a rebuke, a word of correction to his people upon whom the ends of the world are come. What that means is, is that you and I in the New Testament church 
are facing the end days. The, the advent of Jesus Christ signaled the beginning of the end. Amen. When the Messiah came and the new covenant was inaugurated and the Holy Spirit came upon the church to begin the fledgling work of God. That's when we began to see the end days. And you and I, as every day passes by, we watch the news and we hear the things that are going on in the world around us. And I mean, some of us have studied it even deeper. And some people in here could blow your mind with the things that they know about things that are happening happening in our modern day society but what we need to understand is this is that the end of the ages is coming upon us and God has given us a word even in the Old Testament to prepare us so that we would be aware of the fact that God amen has a people and that he wants us to stay focused on what his work for us is Israel as a collective whole was a nation yes but once again they were the people of God they were the children of God and Christian as individuals are the people of God. They are also the children of God. You know, Satan is an expert. One of the things that I've learned is that he's a real good. He's really good at his job of making people feel hopeless, especially after they revisit sin after they've known God. You don't have to raise your hand in here and signify to the congregation whether or not you've revisited sin. Thank you, sister. I appreciate that. I can work with a heart like that. Amen. Whether we've revisited sin, but he's an expert at making people feel hopeless after they've known God. He whispers words of condemnation and guilt. He, he attempts to make God's people carry a burden that they cannot bear. It was never God's will that you nor I try to carry around a burden of guilt because of the failures. They can't bear it. He turns them again into slaves where they are incapable of moving forward in God. Listen to me. The enemy is, is a master and he is so adept. You can think you know the word of God. You can think you understand the spirit of God. You can think you understand the inner workings of God. But I'm telling you right now, the enemy of our soul is slick and he is deceitful and he's wily. And he has a plan of schemes. And listen, it starts off as a little bitty trap. And the next thing you know, when the trap is sprung, you're caught and he will turn you back into a slave. If you don't understand the good word that God would speak. Speak to his people. He makes them incapable of feeling like they can ever move forward again yes. in the things of God. But I'm here to tell you that God has made a new way. Amen. Yes. He's made a new way so that his people could be free. Look at Hebrews chapter 8 verses 10 through 13. This is the Lord speaking. Actually, this is a quote from Jeremiah. The author of Hebrews in the New Testament would quote Jeremiah. And he would remind the people of God. You, you, I don't really know that I should get too deep into this. But you know the Hebrew, the letter written to the Hebrews, many people believe it was the Apostle Paul. I personally believe that it was him. Um, because of the fact that he mentions his bonds and he speaks of Timothy. But that, that's just my opinion. The author never signed his name to it. Um, many people didn't really, many of the Hebrew Christians didn't really respect the Apostle Paul. Whoever wrote this letter understood the Old Testament law and the fulfillment that was in Christ better than anyone that we would have ever known. And the Apostle Paul first certainly meets that bill. But when he, when he, the Hebrew Christians were, what their, what their, uh, what their temptation was, what their trial was, if you will, was to go back towards temple worship. And that may not make a whole lot of sense to you because, you know, you were never a Jew. But, but if you were raised all of your life a particular way and you were told all of your life. See, that's why it's so hard for people that are Jehovah's Witnesses and people that are Mormons and people that are brought up in false religion and even people that are brought up in charismatic type churches to be told, no, the way that you've been going is not the right way and that God has a right way and it's written right here in His Word. But it's very difficult for people to move away from what they've always known and these Hebrew Christians, what they always knew was temple sacrifice. What they always knew was the shedding of animal blood and that there, therefore there was a temptation for them after they had received Christ as their Lord and Savior to move back towards what they had always known. Now for you and I, we're not tempted to move back towards animal sacrifice. We never knew that. 
But instead, what we're tempted as Gentiles, or if you would permit the word heathens, that were probably raised up more in the ways of the world, not in the Jewish ways, whatever it was that you were taught all of your life, whatever it was that you engaged in in your lifestyle, after you gave your life to Christ, then many times you're going to find yourself tempted in that very area to go back to what you previously knew, to go back and to be tempted towards your old life. And he said, Essentially, that's what they were being tempted to go back towards religion. But God said, I'm going to do a new thing. You see, you got to be careful of modern day prophets that prophesy or prophesy, whatever it is that they're doing. And they're talking about all the time in your life. God's going to do a new thing in your life. Listen to me. God's already done a new thing. It's called the new covenant. It's called Jesus dying on the cross. And if God's going to do anything new in your life, it's going to line up according to the word of God. And the new thing is going to be a breath of fresh air in your heart. But it's going to be generated by what Jesus has already accomplished at Calvary. When you receive a revelation of what Jesus has done, I'm not talking about just a head knowledge. I'm talking about a revelation from the Holy Spirit of what Jesus has done. It becomes alive on the inside of your heart and just like a breath of fresh air. You know, that's what the word Holy Spirit in the Greek is, pneuma, where we get pneumatology, where we get new, new, well, it's where the word pneumonia comes from. It describes breath. It describes wind. And whenever you get a revelation of the truth of God, it's like a breath of fresh wind that flows into your heart. And that's the new thing that God desires to do. And what he was trying to tell the Hebrews right here is, listen, you're going backwards. You're being tempted to go back towards what you always knew. But what I'm here to tell you is that I'm going to do a new thing. He said right here, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Not like the Old Testament days whenever he wrote it on tablets of stone. And while Moses was up there getting the law, the children of Israel were downstairs. Well, for lack of better words, having an orgiastic party and making golden calves and saying, oh, this is the God that delivered us from the bondage of Egypt. No, not instead of written on tablets, tablets of stone, it would be written in the heart of his people. Because, see, when you get saved... The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. Amen. That's the beautiful new covenant that God has provided in Christ that God doesn't just walk with us anymore, but instead he lives on the inside of us. And he promised in this new covenant that he would put his laws in their minds and write them in their hearts. And he said, and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for all shall know me. That doesn't mean that God doesn't want teachers in the church. That's not true. The book of Ephesians says that he's given apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. God has called people to teach his people. Amen. But at the same time, it's different in the new covenant. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The book of 1 John talks about the fact that you have an unction. The word is charisma. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all truth. That means whenever the Holy Spirit is in you and God is leading and guiding you in all truth and you hear truth, the Holy Spirit bears witness with that truth that is spoken and says on the inside of your heart, yes, that is the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God that the Holy Spirit lives in our hearts. Amen. This is really where I wanted to get to. He says, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. God says their sins and their iniquities Will I remember no more? That's what God promises to do. He promises to forget our sin because Jesus carried it and paid it for us. Wouldn't it be nice if we were just able to read and believe and experience the freedom of guilt that God promises? Wouldn't that be beautiful? Like if you could just hear the word of the Lord, you know, and say, he says he's not going to remember my sin anymore. And I just know that that's his word and I'm going to believe it and I'm going to walk in that. But all too often, that's not the case. And in the scripture that I read to start my message, God likens his people to a backsliding heifer. But he also promises that he will feed her like a lamb in a large place. You know, the idea of a large place is used a lot by the psalmist King David when he spoke of, Lord, put me in a large place. 
put me in an open space. And what he was talking about there was he was asking God. He, I believe this is what he was doing. He was reflecting back on the days when he was a young boy and he was in the pasture and he was with the sheep. And he was playing the harp. Because that's really what the open space is. That's what the large place is. If you look in the original language, it describes a large green pasture. And young David would remember back in the day whenever he knew that he was in the presence of the Lord. Whenever it might have seemed to some that he was by himself just with those sheep. But he knew better. He knew that the Lord was with him. Because you remember on the day when the bear tried to attack and when the lion tried to attack. David, young David was able to overcome them with the power of the Lord. And that's how he knew when he was going to fight against the giant. That just as the, the lion and the bear, God had given him strength over them. God also would give him strength over that giant. And when David would cry out, Lord, put me in a large place. That's what it was describing. A pasture. Just like in here in Hosea. The Lord says, even though my people Israel are like a backsliding heifer, I will put her in a large place. See, the idea is, is that God's going to bring you to a place of safety. A place where you're no longer in bondage. A place where he's the shepherd and you're the sheep. And he's going to take care of you. Amen. You know... The, but, but, you know, the first picture is that of a backsliding heifer. You know, if you could think of the thought of this, you know, and sometimes I just try to slow down and I try to close my eyes and I try to imagine a picture of what's going on here. A heifer. I, I, I imagine this heifer, she's, she's trying to climb up a slippery slope. You know, it's a female cow, you know. She's, she's trying to climb up a slippery slope because there's an intended destination that she knows that she's supposed to go to, but the, but, the, but the terrain is not conducive to her gaining traction. And I don't really know, but I can just kind of imagine her spreading her back legs out a little bit and kind of lowering her hindquarters down, trying to gain some traction. But no matter what she does, every time she takes one step forward, she kind of slides back two different steps. She can't get to where she needs to go. And so oftentimes it's like the child of God that finds themselves bound up in sin again. And no matter how hard they try, they try to take one step. They try to take two steps. And they got their, head, their feet, you know, out to try to gain some traction. They got their, their, they got their haunches down and they're trying to grind in. They're trying to, 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 like Daddy used to say, suck it up, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. They're trying to hunker down, but they can't. They can't seem to take another step. They just find themselves sliding further and further away from the Lord. But i got to tell you that that's not God's will, amen, that we would stay in a place of, of sliding backwards. You know, there's really no standing still with God. We shouldn't try to fool ourselves. We're either moving forward in the things of God or we are sliding backwards like a heifer without traction. That's just the reality of it. You know, we can try to fool ourselves. We can try to think that we're doing okay. But no, we're either moving forward or we're moving back. God is not okay with complacency. God wants all of our hearts. And if we think that he just is okay with just a little piece of our heart, then we're wrong. And we don't understand the heart of God. We don't understand the ways of God. This is the condition of Israel's heart in this story. But listen, I want you to understand the underlying plot also. <clears throat> Many of you have read the book of Hosea. You understand the underlying plot of Hosea. The story focuses on this prophet whose name is Hosea. It focuses on the prophet and his wife whose name was Gomer. God told Hosea, if you've never read this story, it's kind of amazing. But God told his prophet Hosea to purposefully marry himself to a woman that lived a life of whoredom. Why would God ask a man to do such a thing? In this story, the reason why is not that God is the husband. I'm sorry, the reason why is because God is the husband and Israel is the wife. That's the reality of what's going on. God is the husband, Israel is the wife, and she repeatedly cheats on him time and again. And he loves her and his heart breaks for her. And he wants his prophet to feel what he feels. <coughs> It's the story of a husband and an unfaithful wife. Point number one in this message this morning is the broken heart of God. Hosea chapter one, verse two. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea and the Lord said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms for the land has committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. 
Israel had fallen away from God. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, he had promised Israel that he was bringing her to a new land, a land of milk and honey, and that if she would follow after him, she would be the head and not the tail. She would be above and not beneath. She would experience great harvest. He would not withhold the former and the latter rain. She would experience great harvest. Her storehouses would be filled. Basically, what that describes is for you and I today, the savings account. You'd have so much. God would take care of what you needed today but not only that you'd have stuff saved up you'd have an overflow in the midst of your life but that if they would not follow after him then instead of a blessing their blessing would be turned into a curse I said it in the intro but let me say it again God wanted Hosea to feel what he felt he wanted Hosea to know the pain and the hurt of what it was like to be cheated on why would God ask a man to endure such heartache and pain God had called him to speak to his people God had called him to offer salvation to his wayward wife, to his wayward bride. It's so sad when God's people go in the opposite direction of where he instructed them to go. They have their own mindset and their own heart and they pave their own path and sometimes they never make it back. Don't be confused. Sometimes the people of God that love God and, and desire to serve God and were truly saved. I believe that. I believe the scriptures bear it out. That's my opinion on the yeah. scriptures. I, yeah. I, it's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that sometimes God's people take a pathway and a turn that they never really completely intended to take and they never completely make it back. They're like a backsliding heifer that can't gain traction and finds herself slipping backwards. And even though she's trying with all of the strength that's in her, she can't get the can't, can't get the mo. That's what they used to call it back when we played sports. Can't get the mo going again. Can't get moving again in the right direction because uh, burdened down with guilt and condemnation and feeling unworthy, and the devil constantly whispering in their ear and telling them that they're unworthy and that they're not that God has given up on them. But that's not true. That's a lie. That's the lies of Satan. So sad when God's people with their own mindset and their own heart pave their own path and sometimes never make it back. They can never gain traction again. They just keep sleeping back, slipping backwards, repeated cycles of guilt and condemnation, never being able to see the truth of Romans chapter five, verse eight. Never being able to see the truth of Romans chapter five, verse eight. I mean, they can see it. I mean, your eyes are open. Their retina works. The visual capacity is there. They can read the words on the page, but they never receive the revelation of what Romans chapter 5 verse 8 is trying to speak to God's people. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Hallelujah. While we were yet sinners, the Messiah, the Christ, the one that was promised in Old Testament times, died for us. And the word commitment means to set in place. He set his plan of love in place when we were out of place. It's not as though we deserved his goodness and his right. That's right. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Right? I mean, some, some, of, some of us are so holy. Some of us are so righteous. Some of us just do all the stuff the Lord's asking us to do. And we get so confused as we continue to just walk <laughs> with the Lord. You know, man, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. In Christ. But some, I don't even want to get into all that. I didn't plan on doing this. But you know, there was a lie. There was a lying gospel out there for so many years. That word of faith movement. So much of it wasn't true. That, you know, people just started thinking that because they confessed the right words out of their mouth. The power of life. I, there's a scripture that says the power of life and death is in the tongue. But listen, I don't have time to get into all that. But they, this, is the, this is the root of that gospel. And don't tell me it's not true because I read it out of the authors of the founders of that message that talks about the fact that Jesus was the first born again from sin when he was in hell and he spoke the word and he himself became born again. That is a lie from the pit of hell. It said that Jesus became a sinner on the cross. Had Jesus become a sinner and intrinsically became as he would have never rose from the That's dead. No, Jesus was the sin bearer. That's what the word in the book of Hebrews says. He bore our sin. He was the, he was the offering.
suffering for sin. He took our sin upon him. But the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that people sometimes get so confused because they think, oh, they're the righteousness of God. And they, but they, they, they don't understand that, no, the only way you can be the righteousness of God is because of what Jesus has done in the great exchange that took place. Hallelujah. And the fact that he bore your sin upon himself and he gave you the gift of his righteousness. You were all done and all together out of the way. You were like a backslidden yes. heifer and you yes. couldn't gain Thank traction. You, but God loved you enough to pick you up. Hallelujah. And to give you his righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We didn't deserve his goodness and his grace. No, he gave it to us when we were our worst. Amen. Amen. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. See, I love to study the Bible and you know why? Because every time you think... Every time somebody thinks that they have something, I'm talking about when it comes to the message of the cross. And when you're talking to people, call it whatever you want. You call it the message of the cross, the finished work of Christ, the message of grace, the new covenant. I don't, I don't really care what you call it. I'm just trying to talk about what the Bible's talking about. Amen. And I love getting in conversations with people that are against it. Again it. You know what I'm talking about? And it just fueled my fire to study even harder. We're again you. We don't think that you're right there, little preacher, because you're not following the traditions of the fathers. Yeah. We've all together gone off on another course. I'm following the tradition of the fathers. See, because whenever you look at this, they'll try to come up with water baptism or something like that, washing of regeneration. Right, right. But the reality of it is, is that what this is talking about right here is going back to Old Testament washings. It's talking about the purity of the Old Testament washing. It connects itself to the ashes of the red heifer. And how many times have I taught to y'all in this time and again that the beauty of the ashes of the red heifer is that that carcass was never drained of its blood. Like every other sacrifice that was offered up and it was thrown with slit and its blood poured out. The ashes of the red heifer was different. The red heifer was not, its blood wasn't poured out. That whole animal was burnt and the blood was contained within it. And whenever they would put those ashes in that water and they'd stir it up, they'd make a tincture out of it. And they'd take it and they'd spread it. And what it was doing was spreading the blood of Jesus. It was a type of the blood of Jesus all yes. over the place. That's not by the works of our righteousness which we have done, but through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. This is the message that I try to say so many times in almost every message that I preach that talks about what Jesus did at the cross gives the Holy Spirit permission to work in your lives. Yes. If you read this, according to Kenneth Weiss, the Greek scholar, he talks about the fact that the washing of regeneration is almost like a building permit. Mm. <clears throat> You know, whenever you're going to do a renovation on something, a lot of times, depending on if you're moving walls and stuff like that, you're supposed to get a building permit. At least that's my understanding. What Jesus did at the cross is the building permit that lets the reconstruction begin. That's right. Amen. What Jesus did at the cross gives the Holy Spirit permission to complete the work. It's an, on, it's, a, it's an act that was completed in the past that has an ongoing uh, activity that continues on today. What Jesus did at Calvary 2,000 years ago, that work continues today because the Holy Spirit is allowed to flow, amen, and to bring holiness and righteousness through it. We're talking about, but God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Oftentimes think, Lord, when was my worst? You know, was it before I knew the Lord, some of the things that I did? Before I knew God? Well, I was a mess. Or was it after you knew the Lord? After you knew the goodness of God? After you started to understand His Word and His ways that you still went contrary to the ways of God and cheated on Him? Well, that's when He committed this love for you. That's when he commended his love for you. That's when he set in place his plan when we were our worst, when we were against him. He was preparing salvation for us. He was preparing a word for the us. You know, that's what Hosea means. Did you know? Did you know? You know what Hosea means? It's such a beautiful concept. It means salvation. You know, Hosea is actually a root of Joshua. As a matter of fact, if you go back and you look in the beginning of the book of Joshua, you'll see that Joshua's name originally was Hoshea, and his name was changed to Yeshua. 
And Yeshua, Joshua, is the Hebrew variant of Jesus. And the, the word means salvation. And Joshua is the Hebrew for Jesus. And God allowed Hosea to feel what he felt. And God allowed Jesus to feel what he was feeling. He was brutally stripped of all of his clothing. I just remember the, the story whenever they, they, they blindfolded him and they slapped him and they plucked his beard and they put the crown of thorns on his head and they beat his head with rods. And while he was blindfolded, they said, prophesy, son of man, who it is that strikes you. And they put that purple robe on him in mockery. Look at him, king of the Jews. And they hung him on that cross, naked in humiliation for all the world to look at and to laugh at. He was treated brutally. He only came to love and offer love, but he was wronged. Don't let Satan lie to you. God knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows all the intricate details of your heart. And while... We were yet sinners. God offered Thank salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Don't let the devil lie to you. That was point number one, though. I want us to be reminded of the fact that God's heart is broken. Yeah. And sometimes you're going to find on this fallen earth and in the pain of this fallen earth that sometimes your heart is going to feel broken. That was point number one. Point number two is this. He proved his love and salvation through the purchase price. I heard a preacher say a long time ago, I think it was like the old youth pastor I used to work with that said it. Jimmy Duhon was his name. I heard old preachers say a long time ago that the way you determine the value of an object is according to the price that someone is willing to pay to make it its own. And you know, that's a good word right there. Because sometimes whenever we go through life and we feel unworthy and we feel like we don't have any worth, what we need to be reminded of is that as the child of God, what you need to know is that God, that your value to God is the life of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Look at Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Then said the Lord unto me, go yet. Now this is after the Lord already took, told Hosea to take Gomer to be his wife. And after he's married to her and... She has gone again to her lovers. And it resulted in something. And God speaks again to Hosea. And he says to her, <clears throat> Go yet and love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley. <clears throat> And a half homer of barley. Listen, I want to read this out of the ESV because I feel like it does a little bit of an easier job of understanding it. The ESV says this, The Lord said to me, Go again and love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. You know, the children of Israel in the book of Jeremiah made cakes to the queen of heaven. It was a Babylonian goddess. Uh, and, and, and they continued on in this, in this action throughout her years. Though they turned to other gods and loved cakes of raisins, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethage of barley. You know, the price of a slave was 30 pieces of silver according to the law. Here we see a picture of Gomer who was married to the prophet Hosea, but even after she was married to him, she turned on him and she went and she, she, she lived a life as an adulteress and the result of her action caused her to become a slave. And she's on a slave, the auction block of slavery, and people are bidding for her. Will anybody give me five pieces? Can I get five pieces for this harlot that has been sold into slavery? Somebody give me five or somebody give me ten. And they're over here bidding. And ultimately, 
Hosea purchases her, and yes, it talks about a half of barley, a homer and a half of barley, but the idea, most scholars would agree that a homer and a half equals 15 pieces of silver, plus the other 15 pieces of silver equals 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave. You know, Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Y'all yeah, started thinking about that, man. I don't think that, I think there's something deep right here. I'm just going to be honest with you. I haven't figured it out quite yet, but I sure did think a good bit about it last night and tried to roll it over in my mind again and there's probably even more to it than this but I realized that on that day God well, there were two methods of payment being offered God was offering his son to, to pay the penalty to free people from the bondage of slavery and the world of religion instead was offering a betrayal countless millions a countless millions of Judases from that day moving forward sold themselves out and, and rejected what God was offering in payment for freedom from slavery and instead rejected it and, and instead embraced what the world and what false religion would offer up instead and he was rejected and betrayed for 30 pieces of silver Like those countless others, Hosea's wife moved away. She moved away from her Hosea. She moved away from her salvation. Her choice had caused her to be bound. She had become a slave. You know, the same thing happens to the believer even after he's saved. If he moves in a direction away from God's salvation. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. You become a slave again. Don't think you can't. It's not necessarily the first act of sin that does it. It's usually repeated sin that causes us to be bound again. And sometimes it's not sins of lust, but it can also be the sin of law. Yeah. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, certainly repeated sins of lust will cause the power of sin to be revived in the life of the believer. But so will repeated attempts to place faith in an object other than Jesus. Anything such as rebuking, you know, like you put your faith in how much you rebuke the devil. You don't realize that that's what you're doing a lot of times with you. I'm not saying don't ever rebuke the devil. That's not what I'm trying to get at. I believe in taking authority over him. But I remember what the Archangel Michael said. The Archangel Michael dare not bring a railing accusation against him. But he said, the Lord rebuked thee, Satan. The power is not in your positive confession and saying the right thing all of the time. The power is in what Jesus has already done at the cross. And he's come to set you free. So you can rebuke the devil all day long. But if the object of your faith isn't right, you're not going to gain power over him. And he's just over there laughing and he's tapping his claws on, on, the, on the tabletop. Yeah. So repeated acts of sin, but whether it be rebuking or quoting or praying, I was sharing with somebody last week. I used to take that scripture in my head, casting down vain imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. And I was just quoted over and over and over and over again, trying to get freedom in my thought life. And to be truthful, I'm not saying that for a moment in time when you're thinking of the scripture that it didn't work, but it was never a true freedom. It was never a true release from it. You know, repeated sins, it causes a revival of sin in the life. Look at Romans chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. I don't really have time to properly teach this, but well, we do have actually some time to talk about. Y'all stay y'all bear with me. Y'all stay with me. We're all we're getting moved. We're moving fast through this. <laughs> Romans chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. You're just gonna have to take my word for it because we don't have time to go all the way back to the beginning of Romans chapter 7. Well, you know what I'll do? I'll remind you of it. Is it most people read the book of Romans chapter have you read chapter 7 before? Most people, you don't have to really raise your hand, but I'm sure most people have read Romans, right? I read Romans so many times I don't even know, but even before I had an understanding of it. But, you know, in the beginning, it talks about the fact that it, it, in Romans chapter 7, it talks about a woman that's married to her husband and that she's bound to her husband by law <coughs> until he dies. And then if he dies, she's free to marry another. What God is using is the analogy or illustration of marriage according to the law to talk about our marriage to Jesus. 
And so what ends up happening in this thought process is, is that he actually says it. He says, so now you've been, now that you've died, you've been freed to marry another, even Christ Jesus, so that you can produce fruit. So the idea there is just as in Romans chapter 6, he teaches us that the old man born of Adam died to the power of sin when he got saved. He also teaches us in Romans chapter 7 that the new man or the old man has also died to the power of law and that there's been a change in relationship. And he went from being married to the, to, and, and judged by law to now he can be married to Jesus. And in that new relationship, there's freedom and liberty, amen, to produce fruit for the Lord. Amen. But like so many believers do, when we don't really understand the scripture for the way that it's written, come on somebody, we're all right. guilty of this. And it's not because we're doing it on purpose. We, it's just it, it, the, the enemy tries with all of his might to, to blind us and to put scales on our eyes so that we cannot yeah. see. Because yeah. there's freedom and liberty in the truth of the gospel. Yes. Yes. And so many times, just like I remember, you know, the Apostle Paul, let me just say this about Romans 7 too, real quick. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7 is using himself as an example. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? See, when he wrote Romans chapter 6, he had a revelation of the freedom that he found in Christ. He Hallelujah. understood how it works now. Okay, when he writes Romans 7, he's free. He's experienced Romans 6. But what he's doing is he's reflecting to a time previously in his life when he did not have a revelation. The time frame specifically when after he was a Christian, but he didn't understand how not to walk according to law and instead walk in grace. Now, just bear with me for one moment. Do you, do you realize that, that there's a default position of man? I'm doing some teaching right now. There's a default position in the heart of man to gravitate towards the works of his own hands. You understand what I'm saying? After, the, after Adam and Eve had fallen in the garden, what's the first thing they do? They sew fig leaves together in an attempt to cover their own nakedness. They attempt through the works of their own hands to remedy their own situation. But what does God do? God says, no, that's not going to work. And instead, he provides the first sacrifice and he clothes them with the skins of an innocent animal. But it continues on because in chapter 4, Cain and Abel attempt to present themselves before the Lord. And God had already showed, I believe this with all of my heart, God had already showed their father Adam how to properly approach him. Because when he attempted through the sowing together of fig leaves and God rejected that, instead had to kill an animal to clothe him with the skins of an innocent animal. I believe, listen, any father in here ever teach your children something? Did you try to teach your kids something, right? I mean, if all that there was was God in the first family and God revealed this to Adam, don't you think Adam would have taught his children how to properly approach God? But there's something in the heart of man. And Cain says, I'm not going to go the way because see, it would have required humility for Cain to do that. He would have had to humble himself and go to his, his brother and he would have had to, to purchase from his flock an animal. He might not have even had to purchase it. I don't know. He might have could have traded some vegetables and got, got one of those animals from his brother. But the point to it is this. He did not want to offer up an animal sacrifice. And it wasn't that he didn't want to offer up anything to God. He offered up the fruit of his own works. The fruit of his own hands. I've heard preachers say before, and he probably had them vegetables all shined up. <laughs> you know, kind of like in the fall, you know, I don't know, you know, them cornucopia things, all the vegetables, you know, flowing out of there. He probably had them all shined up, and they were glistening and all pretty. Look at what I've got you, Lord. Look what I've done, Lord. Look what I'm presenting to you. Look at the works of my hands, Lord. Mm, come on. God rejected that sacrifice. <laughs> but he, he was pleased with the sacrifice of Abel. Because man is not going to approach God based upon the works of his own religious righteousness. Right. That God has one way it's been. And listen, he's, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's never going to change. He's got one plan, one way. And he will not deviate from that plan. And one of the, you know, I said all of that because I want to remind you of your own self. I mean, if you can have an honest bone in your body, then you know for a fact. 
that you yourself at some point in time have looked at and viewed your own walk with God as superior to somebody else's. <laughs> You viewed your own walk with God as superior to someone else's and you viewed the own works of your own hands as though God was accepting of it and that he was pleased with you because of all the good stuff you were doing. Amen. I can, I've told the story before how I was sitting in the church and listen, if you smoke cigarettes, I'm not over here to poke you in the eye about smoking cigarettes. It's between you and Jesus, I can tell you he don't want you smoking cigarettes and I can tell you this, he wants to set you free. That's just the word. I'm not going to shrink back from it. But I know that that's the fact because I used to dip skull. I used to dip, well, I dip Kodiak is what I dip towards the end. So I dip when I was 13. It became every part of my life. It was ingrained in my nature. I played baseball and dip. You know, the, back in them days, the coaches let us dip. I used to buy smokeless tobacco at the store when I was 13 years old. Yeah. And Sabrina, you did? I'm <laughs> just that. I got you. <laughs> anyway, I used to, I used to, I used to, it was part of every part of my life. You couldn't smoke in a movie theater, but you could, you could sure throw a dip in your lip. And, and so it was part of my every, it was part of my life, you know, and I can remember for 12 years, even as a Christian, man, I struggled with dipping. Oh, so many times I wanted to be free. I cried to God, please set me free, Lord. Can't tell you how many rolls of dip I'd throw into golf, and then I'd call up Danielle when I was working, and I was going, send me some more out here. <laughs> you know, and, and, and anyway, I can remember, though, I'm trying to talk about Cain's self-righteousness. I can remember one time being in church, and I could smell cigarettes on somebody. And I can remember thinking in my heart, they still smoke <laughs> Dude, what kind of thinking is that? That I'm over here dipping about a can of half a, 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 a dip a day, and I'm over here judging somebody for smoking. It's like blinded by sin. Uh, yeah. The works of thinking in your own heart that you've accomplished or you've arrived at some place in your walk with God that makes you superior to someone else. I'm trying to give you an example of how, of how Adam and Eve thought, the default position. I'm spending a lot of time here, but I'm trying to make a point. Adam and Eve went to a default position, attempted to cover their own nakedness with the work of their own hands. Cain attempted with his shiny vegetables to present the work of his own hands toward God. And, the, and you and I, in our own mindsets, at some point in time in our walk with God, have thought of ourselves as superior because of the, what we do. How many times have you... Listen, the first time I read the Bible, I just thought I was all that. <laughs> I guarantee if I ask people to raise their hand who's read the whole Bible, there wouldn't be too many hands raised. Right? I mean, I'm just being honest. But whenever I read the whole Bible, I was like, oh man, now I've arrived. You know? Or I thought I was better than somebody else. We should read the whole Bible. But the point is, is that you can, should not, ought not think more highly of yourself than what you should. I guess I'm trying to make all that point because the Apostle Paul, what you need to understand is he knew nothing but law in the beginning. See, you think, I try to step back and I try to think how, what these men would have been going through. And the only way I know how to do that is by what the Word of God says and also what I've, I've experienced in my own walk with God. It doesn't mean the Apostle Paul was like mad, thank God he wasn't. But what I'm trying to say is, is that as human beings, we all experience something similarly to one another because we're all in this trial of life together and if I have a default position to move back towards works and I like for people to see listen there's parts in Matt's heart that ain't right I mean I've gotten a lot better through time God's really humbled me a lot more through time but there used to be a time whenever I loved the fact that I knew more about the Bible than most people have talked to I mean, I'm just telling you, my heart wasn't right in that. I can remember somebody would try to say something in the bar, and if it was something that I didn't think was right, I'd be like, fool. Now I'd be on a breath in front of everybody. Kind of like I really need to apologize to the music ministry this morning with the way I said that about, you know, y'all not being up here. But anyway, y'all forget that. But I would be quick to like, boom, put it on. Stop them in their tracks. You know, that's not right. That's not, the, that's not the heart of the Lord. The works. And so the Apostle Paul, though, what I'm trying to say is all he knew was the law before. Right? 
All he knew was the law before, so even after he gave his heart to Jesus, we automatically think that, man, the Apostle Paul had an immediate revelation of the fulfilled work of Jesus Christ. No, that's not true. As a matter of fact, if you map it out, some scholars believe at least three years according to the book of Galatians, but many people believe about ten years between going back to his previous home in, in Tarsus, but also being in the Arabian wilderness where he went through so many different things is that that's whenever Romans chapter 7 took place in the Apostle Paul's life. Where after he had gotten saved and he moved into Christ, what he started to do was he started to add some law back to his Christianity. See, for you and I, it might be, okay, I'm saved now, I'm going to heaven. And when I got saved, this is, what the preacher, this is what the preacher said, this is the best day of your life. You got saved, now you got some stuff you need to do. And it's true, you do have, you got a lot of, we got a lot of learning to do. But the way that it was presented was, oh, you got to work now. You see what I'm saying? You got to come to church. Yeah, and you're doing all of these things. And without you really realizing it, you are now starting to equate your righteous standing with God with what you do. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. How many times did you tell yourself you were going to read three chapters in the Bible today and you barely got through a half of one and you felt guilty? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Condemnation and guilt. You're, without you even realizing it, you're, play, you're basing your standing of righteousness based on what you're doing instead of what Jesus is doing. And the devil's all too happy to help you out with that problem. Yes. That's a fact. Come on. He's going to sit there and he's going to whisper, you're a failure. You'll never be. Well, look at this, man. How are you ever going to learn the word of God? Preacher tells you you need to read the whole Bible. You can't even get through a half a chapter. <laughs> He's a, he's a speaker of lies. And so what I'm trying to say is the Apostle Paul would have attempted to add some type of law back to his, to his faith in Christ Jesus. I used to like the way Lauren Larson used to say, he said, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a pork chop sandwich. I shall not eat pork. It might have been. You see, like in other words, I've received Christ, now I'm righteous, but boy, just think how righteous I'll be if I still don't eat pork. <laughs> And don't think that that's so silly because much of the early church told, told people that they still needed to be circumcised. Yes, until they received the revelation that Jesus was the fulfillment of Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Jesus is the fulfillment of the removal of filthy flesh through the shedding of blood. Yes. And so in Romans chapter 7 verse 9 through 11, now that I've presented all of that, I didn't plan on going that deep into it, but it was required... The Apostle Paul says, for I was alive without the law once. Now, I've gotten into arguments with Baptist preachers before, and you know what? I'm ready to talk to them again if they want to do that. But many Baptists believe that, the, that this is talking about the fact that the Apostle Paul was never saved at this point. That, in other words, he was alive and in his childhood, before he understood the law, sin was dormant in his life. But then once he became of an age of understanding the law, that's whenever sin gained power in his life. But just a, just a, a, super, a relatively superficial study of this passage would, would refute that. What he's saying is, is, for I was alive without the law once. And you go back in the first four to five verses when he says, there's a woman that's married to a man, and according to the law, she has to stay married to that man until he dies. But then when he dies, she's free to marry another, and you've been free to marry Jesus so that you can produce fruit. Based on that context that he's already given, he's saying, I was alive without the law once. I was freed from the law whenever I was born again in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Look what he says. But when the commandment came, when I added to my Jesus, mm. whatever it was that I added to my Jesus, it's not going to be a pork chop sandwich for you. It might be, I shall not see PG-13. I shall not do this. Go ahead. And make yourself a little law. You better learn how to let the Lord deliver you from whatever it is that you need deliverance from. And not sit there and say you're going to make a rule and you're going to make a law and you're going to abide by it. Because I'm telling you right now, grace will be so frustrated in your life and you'll feel the power of sin resurrecting its ugly head and, and manifesting itself in your life. Look what he says. I was alive without the law once. I was a Christian. Free from the law for a moment in time. You know, when I first got saved, man, I tell you all the story a lot. When I walked up in Twin City Gospel, man, I was so bound by so many things. 
when I, when that pre, when that lady said she kept talking about the blood, the blood, the blood, and I was like, I told y'all, I was like, all oh, like freaking out in my. Why does she keep talking about the blood? That's so weird. Why is she saying that? And then she said it. She said the innocent one had to die in place of the guilty one. And she stopped the service and she said, the Holy Spirit's dealing with somebody's heart in here. And dude, my heart started beating out of my chest. And I can remember I had that. Blood. I thought I was David Lee Roth or something. I started running to the front up here. I fell on my knees. And my hair was flowing all in. It went, and I fell down. And I was like, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Man, you don't see people doing that kind of stuff anymore. I mean, I'm not trying to talk big, but back in the day, some of y'all know, people used to go to the altar. They weren't scared to call you out. You need to come give your heart to Jesus. The Holy Spirit pulled me, man. And when I stood up on that day, I'm telling you right now, it was like the weight of sin had been released for me. And for two weeks, dude, for two weeks, I was free, man. Yep, gone. Why gone? The desire for touching a woman that I wasn't supposed to touch, gone. I mean, I was offshore on a boat for two weeks, man. I wasn't doing nothing but reading the Bible. I read the book of Revelation first. God had put me on that boat with two Christians from Dulac that loved Jesus so much. All they did was talk about Jesus in between doing their work. And they were so happy to have this little neophyte Christian, man. <laughs> but then next thing you know, I started adding law back to my grace. Oh, yeah. yeah. Stuff started jumping back on. First thing was the dip, then I felt guilt and condemnation. The next thing you know was drinking, and next thing you know, like when it comes to drinking, then I, you know, I start thinking about the girls the wrong way and end up in places I ain't got no business being, doing things I got no business doing. When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. We're really, we're really teaching Romans 7 this morning. It's supposed to be about Hosea, but I guess this is where the whole spirit wanted to go. <laughs> when the commandment came, when I added law to my grace, sin revived and I died. You know that word revived right there in the Greek is only used twice in the New Testament. It's used right here, and it's also used in Romans 14. And in Romans 14, it says, Jesus died and revived. This is what I would tell the Baptist preacher when he wants to argue with me about this. That word revive describes something that was previously dead and now it lives again. The only way that sin can be dead at one point in time in the life of a, is in the life of a believer after he has given his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. The argument that the Apostle Paul just wasn't old enough doesn't stand because like Brother Larson also used to say, and I used to love it, if you give one rubber ducky to two, two, to two one-year-olds even and put them in the same crib and back away, <laughs> you're going to have a really funny show to watch. I don't know if it's really funny. It might be a sick show. But the point being is this, is that it's almost like putting two pit bulls together because at one point in time, he's going to say, it's mine. Amen. My dad used to love that about Isabella. He'd give her something on purpose and then he'd snatch it away from her. She said, it's mine. And my dad would just, he would just love it. He'd say, it's mine. He'd tell her right and growl right back at her. And he'd give her that good and snatch it away. My dad would say, he'd try to put a bulldog in her. But you see that, that's what it is. That, that, what, I'm, what is my point to that? The sinful nature is ingrained in us. And our first birth with Adam, sin is already in us. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You don't have to teach a child to cheat. It's already on the inside of them. The Apostle Paul says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived. It was dead and dormant for a period of time. But then sin revived and I began to die. And the commandment which was ordained to life. You ever notice that too? You know, the, the commandment or the law or even our religious activity are all good things. The Apostle Paul says, God forbid that the law would be unholy. No, the law is of God. Apostle Paul said, I'm carnal. I'm the problem. I'm the one that's sold under Amen. sin. The law isn't the problem with God. God has a purpose for the law. Right. It's not our Christian, our Christian uh, 
activities that we do as far as for reading the word of God and praying and going to church and being involved in ministry. None of that is bad. Those are all good things. But it's when we shift our focus of faith away from what Jesus has done in order to gain right standing with God and shift it now to what we do instead of what Jesus did. That now, this, that even though I was alive once without the law, without Without the law, sin revived and I began to die. Now look at this part. I'm going to move forward after this. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. The word occasion there describes, I said this wrong last time and Sean was able to correct me, thank God. That whenever we used, uh, I said Kuwait, but it was Dubai, right? We used Saudi Arabia as a, as a, uh, a base of operations, right? To attack Iraq. Remember that in the first desert storm? I said Kuwait, but it was actually Saudi Arabia. We use Saudi Arabia as a, as a base of operations. Sin uses law as a base of operations to gain power in the life of the believer. Listen, put up there real quick, man, uh, manual, please. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. For sin... I'm sorry. Yeah, we're The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. When you attempt to live according to the law or a system of rules and regulations, you give power to sin. That's what this verb means. It means revive something that was dead, but now it lives again. You see, we're talking about Gomer. We're back to Gomer now. She's on the auction block of sin. She's being sold for 30 pieces of silver. And, 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 you know, that's not what normal Christianity is supposed to look like. Normal Christianity is not supposed to look like Gomer on the auction block of sin, sold as a slave in bondage again. But for so long in the church, we, and I'm talking about us as, as believers, have lived an abnormal life of Christianity in bondage and failure that we've had a hard time really understanding what true Christianity is supposed to look like. A walk of faith, a walk of victory. Amen? Amen. So Gomer was bound up as a slave on the auction block, auction block being sold to the highest bidder, but the church has been living abnormal Christianity for so long that we've forgotten what it's supposed to look like. It doesn't look like Gomer. God has a plan of purchase. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That word redemption, it describes a releasing that is effected by the payment of a ransom. You've been released because a ransom was paid. For her, it was the equivalent of 30 pieces of silver. For you and I, it was the shedding of Jesus' blood because the book of Leviticus says that the life of the creature is in the blood. Hallelujah. And when the blood is poured out, there's no more oxygen carrying capacity and the creature dies. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died, hallelujah, to pay the ransom, to pay the penalty, to buy us off the auction block of slavery. I'm to point number three now. We're about to close. Bear with me. Point number three, there's a new dawn and with it comes new hope. I want you to see Psalm chapter 30 verse 5. For his anger endures but a moment in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning. Amen? You ever felt miserable in the nighttime and you you hope and long for the break of the new day because you, but the sun to come up, amen, because you just know that there's going to be some hope, hallelujah, when the new day arrives. Sometimes we're in the weeping of the night. It feels like we aren't going to make it. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. God never wants to leave you alone. You need to know that. But he will allow you to feel pain for a greater good. Amen? Amen? Oh, this is good right here. I know I've kept you a long time, but this is something that you're going to need to hear. You may not really want to hear it right now, but at some point in time in your life, you're going to need to remember that the preacher told you the truth about the word of God. That on this earth, there's going to be pain. And sometimes you're going to feel and experience 
pain. And God doesn't want to leave you alone, but he will allow you to feel pain for a greater good. How will we know how good he is if we never experience the pain of how bad things can be? Amen. How will you know the goodness of God if you've never experienced how mean the world will treat you? Does that mean that God wants you to go out there like Gomer and do the thing? No, of course not. But he knows that his people are an obstinate and a stubborn and a stiff-necked people many times. I'm speaking to the preacher. <laughs> not you. I would never say that. About <laughs> And he will allow you to experience pain of how bad things can be. And then when he shows up in the midst of all that pain and he brings his joy, we learn to really love and appreciate him even more. Amen. When he shows up in your situation and he brings hope and he brings comfort. Amen. It's such a beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. Hosea chapter 2 verse 16 and 17. And it shall be at that day, says the Lord, that thou shalt, thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bailey. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. See, God has a way of letting you experience some things that the world will offer you and allow you to experience the pain of what that world brings so that ultimately he will bring you to a place where when the new day dawns and the new hope arises, he has taken out of your mouth the ways of the world. He said, one day they're going to call me Ishi. They're going to call me husband. They're no going to more going to call me Bailey, which means master because Baal was her master. She was looking to Baal, the Canaanite god of rain, in order to give her the rain that she needed for her harvest to come through. She was no longer looking to the Lord to be her rainmaker. Instead, she was looking to the Canaanite gods of Baal. And many times God's people are no different. They look to the things that the world will offer them. They look to substances to numb their mind. They look to relationships to comfort their heart. And the reality of it is, is that it still continues to leave them empty and broken and hurting of heart. But God has a way of getting you through the painful times. And he has a way of convincing you that one day you'll no longer call him Bailey. But instead you'll call him Ish. He is my husband. Hallelujah. He is the lover of my soul. We usually can't understand why we have to go through painful trials until they are over and we can see the big picture. Then we can better appreciate what God was doing. Right. In that day, Israel will call her, call him her husband. You know, God doesn't want to be str second string in our hearts. Yes. Amen. How, how would you feel? If you were, would you want to play second string to somebody in a relationship? You don't want to be second string, man. You don't want to ride the pine in that situation, right? That's, that's no fun to that. You don't want to be second string. God doesn't want to be second string either for a person's love. Of course not. And God doesn't want to play second string for ours. Look at 1 Peter 3.15. This is what the Lord says. <clears throat> This is what Peter says for the Lord. He speaks for the Lord. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. You know what that word sanctify means? It means to set it apart. To separate it out. It means to be made holy. But it has the idea of separating something and putting it in a special and a distinct place. The word of God says for you and I to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. There's supposed to be a special place. And our hearts for the Lord. Amen? Amen. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and in fear. You know that if the Lord has a sanctified spot in your heart, if you've separated him out and put him in the special place in your heart, do you realize that people are going to know that there's something going on with you that's different than the other people that they've encountered? And they're going to want to know, hey, what is this, man? What is it that's going on in your life? Always be ready with meekness and fear to give an account on what's going on on the inside of your heart. I got a couple more thoughts real quick. Hosea chapter 2 verse 15. We're talking about the fact that there's a new dawn ahead. There's new hope that comes with the rising of a new sun. Amen. Amen. That even though Israel's experiencing pain... 
God has a plan, hallelujah, of restoration. It says in Hosea chapter 2, verse 15, I will give her vineyards from this and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth Thank you, Jesus. and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Yeah. Does anybody remember where the valley of Achor was? Or what that has to do with? I like I like for our maybe maybe one day we'll have like a a, a computerized system and y'all can like have like some little controllers in the seat because I mean, sometimes <laughs> I don't want to talk and y'all can like there'll be like a multiple choice. And can the, the valley of Achor was where Achan and his family and all of his possessions were destroyed. Y'all remember that the children of Israel had just experienced a great victory whenever the walls of Jericho had fallen and then the next place where they were going was a place called Ai and God told them do not take of the dedicated things in other words the possessions and the belongings that had been offered up in dedication to the false gods and Achan took it and he hid it in his tent remember that and whenever and then and, and they suffered they suffered a great defeat at Ai and 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 God made Whenever they found out that it was Achan, they took Achan and his family and all of his possessions and they destroyed him. And they named the valley there where they destroyed him the Valley of Achor. It means the Valley of Troubles. Sometimes in our life, you know, we find ourselves in the midst of troubles. We find ourselves in the midst of pain. But what the Lord says right here is this, is that the Valley of Achor, the Valley of Troubles, will become like a door for you that you will walk through. Amen. And it's going and you will sing there yes, as in the day. It's a door of hope that even though you've experienced pain, even though you've experienced turmoil, even though you never knew how you were going to get through it, that valley that you were in, that was a valley of troubles. The Lord says it's going to be a door of hope for you and that when you walk through it, amen, there's going to be a new place, a new season in the midst of your life. Thank you, Jesus. Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. You know, I've said a lot this morning. I've used a lot of words. But one thing that you can never forget as a child of God is that he loves you. Yes. I don't think that I can say that enough to say it. Let me say it again so that everybody can hear it. God loves you. Yes, sir. He loves you, and Satan wants you to forget that. Yes. Don't be confused and start thinking that the chastisement of the Lord is condemnation. Right. In other words, when the Lord corrects you, don't let Satan lie to you and tell you that God doesn't want you anymore. In his correction, he may have torn, but he will heal. He might have smitten, but he will bind up. This reminds me of the scripture out of Matthew, and I will close with this thought out of Matthew chapter 4, verse 21. I'm not going to go through the whole story again of how God made this scripture so personal in my own life. When he sent a young prophet to my house to speak a word to me in a time when I needed it. It says, going on from there, he saw their two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father. And they were mending their nets. Mm. And he called them. Mm. See, even though the Lord is torn, he will heal is what he said in Hosea. And in this scripture here, they were on the deck and they were mending the nets. And then I'm not going to go through the whole story. But in this word that was spoken specifically for me, there was an old man on the deck of a boat and he was mending nets. You know, you can't catch fish when you have holes in your nets. God had called them to be fishers of men to win and catch souls. But just as a net with holes can't catch fish, a life full of sin causes holes that can't catch souls. Amen. But God is in the mending business. Yes, he is. It means to repair and to set straight that which was broken. If you will allow God to do his work, he will mend your nets. Amen. He will, he will repair and he will make whole your heart. Amen. Amen. 